Hi, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Stoller Family Estate. We're talking to Melissa Burr today. It's January 24th, 2019. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, Melissa, let's start you off by asking, why wine? Why wine? Well, first of all, it's delicious. And uh, a lot of reasons, really. I grew up in Oregon, and I went to college here in Oregon, and I was going to go into something different. And I saw the industry emerging. I fell in love with wine. I started drinking it during my college years and just was fascinated with the diversity of varieties and places and styles and all that. Mm -hmm. So I just le got led in that direction for, for many reasons. Yeah. Was there a particular wine that you fell in love with? Was it something that kind of triggered for you? There wasn't one AHA wine that pushed me into the industry. It was more a collection of things. Mm -hmm. So one being that when I went to Portland State University, I lived really close to Zupans right there on McAdam and they did a fantastic job of hosting tastings mm -hmm. weekly. So I would shut my chemistry book and go down there and I really enjoyed it. So that's what really got me interested in wine in general. And I was studying to go into medicine. I was, I was getting into um, the naturopathic college in Portland. So I was taking my pre-med requisites at Portland State. So I did a lot of, a lot of the science and, and studies. So when I finished that degree, that bachelor's of science, instead of going directly to graduate school for naturopathic medicine, I started really thinking about longer term and lifestyle and opportunity and, um, and all that was really enjoying wine mm -hmm. and then saw this industry emerging mm -hmm. and I saw that that could be a really interesting thing to to try out to look at this industry and see what it offers because a lot of a lot of what I was interested in was was winemaking in particular but mm -hmm. it has um, a lot of science background so since I had that already I just thought well instead of going into graduate school I basically got cold feet looking at the huge debt of eighty thousand dollars of financial debt five years of studying living in the city I thought well, maybe I'll try something different mm -hmm. so I decided to be an intern for one harvest and that's what really started me into the industry in general as I did that and it just took off from there did you find that the science background was helpful as you were getting started absolutely yeah, yeah it was it, tremendously helpful because mm -hmm. of just the you know the basics of the you know pH of wine and the TA and the, the in-house labs that I was faced with right away as an intern and just the understanding kind of a basic understanding of some of the foundation of fermentation mm -hmm. and, and I studied more after I knew I wanted to get into the industry sure. but having some of that core science was certainly helpful. Sure. Yeah. So when you decided to, to, to kind of dip your toe in, uh, where did you find an internship and, and what, sort of what was your role? Well, that was a fun story for me to um, think about still, but at the time as well. I was really interested in vineyards and wineries that had an organic focus. Mm -hmm. And so naturally, I looked at Cooper Mountain Vineyards in Beaverton. I was really compelled with the fact that they, make or they grow their grapes organically and they farm them biodynamically as well. So I called them a whole bunch, I, <laughs> a lot. So I, I just called and called because I was really determined to talk to them and that was my first choice because mm -hmm. of those reasons. I had never made wine before and finally did get connected with them and got an internship. So that was 2001. So I started then in 01 right before harvest, which is late August and mm -hmm. I just jumped in and four days after I started my internship at Cooper Mountain, the assistant winemaker quit and so... Right before harvest? Right before harvest <laughs> and there wasn't an on-site head winemaker at the time. They had a consultant, Rich Cushman, who had been working with them for a long time mm -hmm. and had a great understanding of the process and their vineyards and such. So he was available as a consultant that year, luckily, but it was me and the vineyard crew and Rich Cushman remotely, and we we uh, fermented about 16,000 cases worth of wine. So it was an awesome opportunity to learn on the fly and get my hands literally on a lot of things I probably shouldn't have right away. <laughs> but fortunately, again, for, for Rich Cushman, he spent volumes of, of time mm -hmm. with me on the phone and, and in person too, like just walking through all the different things, sure. the million questions I had. Sure. So that was my first internship and I loved it. I loved the challenge, I loved the people there, the vineyards are beautiful, just the whole 
combination of you know harvest and fermentation and blending and all the things was mm -hmm. it was great so I stayed there for a couple years and continued to develop my skills I took some courses at Oregon State University so I took the fermentation science with Barney Watson mm -hmm. and, and learned a lot there I took classes at Chemeketa Community College mm -hmm. they have the VIT mm -hmm. and Enology program which is, is really strong there so I took a handful of classes I didn't get my degree I was kind of burnt out on degrees at this time because that pre-med science degree was enough for a little while for me and so <laughs> I wanted to be more on the job and learning as I was going with, with complementary classes so sure. I did that and I was at Cooper Mountain for the 01 and the 02 harvest and then I came on board to Stoller in 2003. So how did that happen? How did you end up here? Well, I ended up here through networking and a lot of luck, really. So the way it all happened was I went to the, the Steamboat Conference, mm -hmm. which is in Southern Oregon, and in 2003, in that summer. And Steamboat is fantastic. It's been going on a long time. Winemakers come from all over the world, really, and they bring wines and you taste you taste wines blind and you provide really constructive, honest feedback about wines. And it's a great opportunity to learn a lot, but also to network and meet other winemakers. So I did that in 2003 with Cooper Mountain. And I met a lot of people. I met some folks that were connected with Shehalem Winery. Mm -hmm. So Michael Davies and his wife, Anna, and a host of other people. But at that time, we spent some time and they were talking, we just had conversations and about wine and interests and all that. Then time went on and I got a letter in the mail with a couple bottles of Stoller 2001 Pinot Noir. And the letter was an invitation to have a conversation with the Stollers about a position that was that they were creating for a winemaker. Wow. And that was that was a wow. I was <laughs> like, wow, this is incredible. And so I went forward and I was honored and very excited about that. So that's how I got started. And I think that letter came because of my connections with, probably with Michael Davies and Anna and people I met talking about you know, who's in the area, who could be interested in this position for a winemaking position for the Stollers, mm -hmm. which at that time was for a very small amount of wine. So 2003, Stoller Vineyard, the, the estate here, was 120 acres, I believe was 120, it could have been 110, but 120 acres planted, mm -hmm. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, a little Riesling and Pinot Blanc. But at that time, the, the, the um, concept for the Stoller brand was to take just a very small amount of the estate fruit and make the Stoller wines. Mm -hmm. And the rest was sold to other producers, including Shehalem and Argyle and a whole host of people. The vision that Bill Stoller had then was to be a, a world-class world vineyard, grow fruit, and have a host of different wine, wineries make mm -hmm. wine. So he hired, you know, he was looking for someone to make about a thousand cases of wine. So, yeah, I interviewed with them, and it was quite a long process because him and his late wife, Kathy, they travel a lot, mm -hmm. especially in the summer for both business and for vacationing. So I think I met with them three or four times, just over, I met them, and then I met with them and the vineyard manager at the time, and I met with them and probably their dog, you know, just so many <laughs> times of meeting. And then I finally got the job right before harvest of 2003. So. Did you have a sense for what they were looking for from you? Did you have a sense for why you had been, why you'd been selected and why you were eventually won the job? I think really it was um, a personality fit. They are very loyal to local people mm -hmm. and I grew up here in Oregon and I was very honest in my interview with them and so they probably appreciated that. I was surprised they kept calling me back but it was still, it was a good, good exchange. I had a, a strong science background. I was really determined and passionate mm -hmm. about Oregon Pinot and making high quality wines and I was looking for a, a wine job that had that same vision to make you know, the best quality wines really and not cut corners and just have, have a really supportive environment to do so. So that probably fit their, mm -hmm. their vision then. And it was a small brand. So they, I think, appreciated the fact that I was passionate and also possibly that I didn't have a tremendous amount of experience because I could grow with the brand. Mm -hmm. I still think that was such a stretch looking back. I probably would have hired somebody that had 10 years experience, you know, coming out of 
something else. But regardless, you know, I did I got the job, and it was a fantastic opportunity, and, and still is mm -hmm. to this day. So, so tell me about your first memories, first experiences once you got to Stoller, and now you now you're the winemaker. You have this prestigious brand. You yes. have these expectations. So, what was the next step? What was it? How did you tackle it? Well, a lot of different things, a lot of different ways. But when I did get the offer to be the, the winemaker, it was right before harvest of 2003. And I did not want to leave Cooper Mountain right before harvest. Mm -hmm. I think that's a terrible thing to do in this industry to everybody out there. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't want to do that unless it was absolutely you know, the worst case. So I did both harvests and that was challenging sure. but in addition about two weeks after I got the offer for the Stoller job I found out another milestone in my life was happening as I was pregnant with my, my first son and so very exciting I've always wanted to be a mother mm -hmm. I just didn't necessarily plan for two big things <laughs> happening within two weeks right so right. that was something that was exciting and nerve-wracking mm -hmm. and so went forward did both harvests was in my first trimester and just very it, it st sticks in my mind to this day sure all the smells and all the experiences <laughs> <laughs> of uh, two wineries and a lot of stress of starting a new really prestigious position so nevertheless just went forward and and did both harvests and I was really pretty remote with the Stoller harvest the wines were made at Shehalem with mm -hmm. the team there so I'd stop in and check in and there was, we had an intern that was dedicated to making the the wines that year that harvest of 03 so I did that and then I proceeded to do a lot of reflecting and thinking about the next chapter of my life being a mother mm -hmm. and I went to talk to Bill I like to tell the story because it makes me really proud to still be here and to be working with him but I went to him and told him my news I sat down in his corporate office for his staffing company in Tualatin mm -hmm. and he's all dressed up and I got all dressed up and I went and told him you know I am really thrilled for this opportunity to be here with you but, and he says, but, but what? Nobody starts something with a but and then has it, you know, what is it? And so I, I told him, I'm pregnant, I've always wanted to be a mother and I'm likely not gonna be the person for this position and we just got the job, but I feel like we should look for somebody that's very available. Like if mm -hmm. I have a baby, I'm not gonna be 60 hours a week. I don't know when, you know, it's, it's a big thing. And he was just very supportive and mm -hmm. didn't want any of that. He said, it's, it's great, congratulations, and, and truly supported me through the, all of that. So it was a, a pretty tremendous thing, I think. Sure. And when I look back at it again, it's a, special, it's a good testament to character. Mm -hmm. And so 2003 was a big year, you know? <laughs> it, it had my son in April, and, and then uh, we were making the wines at Shehalem. So I spent a lot of time at Shehalem Winery, which was fantastic. I learned a lot mm -hmm. about the Stoller Vineyard because Shehalem is a partner of, of Stoller. Bill was a 50% investor and, and partner with that brand at that time. Mm -hmm. And Harry Peterson Nedry was the winemaker and co-owner. So he had been, Harry and the crew have been working with Stoller Fruit since the very first harvest of 96. And so I was able to make the Stoller wines there under that roof literally and learn everything I could from Harry and the team about Stoller Wines. Mm -hmm. And so I did that in 03 and continued in 04 the same way. We harvested the, the allocated sections that were meant for the Stoller label and made those wines, both Pinot Noir and Chardonnay mm -hmm. at Shehalem. And then at that time, we started talking about building a winery on the property here at Stoller. Mm -hmm. Bill was, was wanting to do that at that time. He said, well, this brand is establishing now and it would make sense to have a boutique winery on the estate vineyard, maybe have a tasting room by appointment. And so the idea came and then came all the planning, lots and lots of, of meetings and, and things to design what the Stoller winery that's here now. It was built it, about, over about a year and a half mm -hmm. and it was open just before harvest of 2005. So. That was another milestone, and a milestone vintage as well. Just having that first vintage in this brand new, state-of-the-art, LEED-certified winery. At that time, in 05, it was the very first gold LEED-certified winery in the world. So it was, it was neat to be able to, and, and challenging, to work through that <laughs> process of having a winery built and be LEED-certified. It's sure. a lot of paperwork and accounting and, and point collection and 
what goes into that is just taking note of everything, every ingredient, having recycled materials, uh, sourcing sourcing products for the winery that were within a 250 mile radius. Oh, wow. Really environmental sure. focus. We've got uh, low uh, low emitting lights and low flow fixtures for water. Mm -hmm. We gener we offset a lot of the power here through solar. So that was another big thing to work through and to get established for the LEED certified winery. So sure. that was all happening it, leading up to the 05 harvest and it was pretty uncertain whether or not we were gonna be able to harvest and have the fruit and the wine made in the facility because it wasn't quite ready, which I've learned is normal, right? So now it seems like just how things go. Mm -hmm. never, n nothing's quite ready, but especially construction projects, especially in a winery. So um, the fruit, we, we made it all happen. And that's again, a, a milestone vintage for me because I was able to work on this beautiful facility for the first time. The tanks got set right before the fruit came in, like within a week. So, you know, dusting up, cleaning off the tanks and fermenting the wine and going from there. Amazing. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it was. Coming back up a second to 2003, you're talking about your, kind of your milestone year there. How were you able to balance your demands, motherhood and new job and a new, and a new place? That's a good question. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> Just, uh, well, a few things really. I mean, I was able to work closely with the Shehalem team mm -hmm. you know, and work with them and, and have wines made. I had you know, help from people there too in the cellar and things. And then I was able to work from home quite a bit. I didn't have an office yet per se. So in a way that was an advantage because I could mm -hmm. work from home. And even after I had Austin, my first son, I, I did that. And just the support really from the strollers and the understanding and, and good communication. Sure. So. And my mom and my husband and <laughs> friends and, and lots of glasses of wine too. Of course. After the baby came. Of course. Yes. Of course, yes. When you took over at Stoller and you were getting going, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, besides kind of all the chaos of, of having an off a different site and you know and a new child and all that, were there unforeseen challenges in the actual wine making process itself, or were you pretty much prepared for making that amount of wine, that quality of wine? I think there's there's always been challenges, but especially then, I'd only been in working in the industry for a few years. Certainly, like I, you know, there's challenges in, in everything, just overthinking things and not having this the experience or confidence. Mm -hmm. But with that, there were so many people that supported, and it's such a, it was a collaborative industry. And a lot of winemakers were really helpful to me. Mm -hmm. you know, Tony Reinders, I called him a lot, and. Rich Cushman and um, just lots and lots of, of people were helpful. Harry Peterson Nedry, we did a lot of tastings and things together. I started working with a consultant out of Burgundy right around that time, mm -hmm. Kiriakis, Kiranopoulos, and I still work with him to this day. So he's been tremendous. And so that, yeah, certainly there were, there were challenges and learning curves about new equipment and the facility itself. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful, really immaculate, um, it, detailed facilities, what I'm trying to say. So there's a lot of nuances to the mechanical side of this building that are still ongoing, but point being, yes, there were there were challenges there that I faced, sure. but it was exciting, really. It keeps you very interested and engaged and a lot of opportunity. Yeah. You mentioned the confidence. I'm curious if you, if you can pinpoint a moment or a year when you kind of felt like, I've got this, I'm a winemaker now, I can make, I can make a decision and stand behind it. I think, I don't know what could, if I can pinpoint it, but mm -hmm. I think it just came with, with several vintages mm -hmm. and it still happens to this day. I'm very fortunate today because I have a team of incredibly intelligent winemakers and cellar hands and enologists to work with. So it's very collective mm -hmm. and I feel very comfortable and confident with that. But even with processes in general with winemaking, it took a few vintages. I mean, an example is I remember back to, I don't remember what year, maybe 05 or 06, mm -hmm. I would go through and taste barrels in the winter. So at just a few months after harvest and the Pinot Noirs in particular taste so odd at that time. You know, they're, they're going through their secondary fermentation. Sometimes it's just partial and they smell and, and taste completely different mm -hmm. than they're going to be. 
but not having a big Rolodex of years to like reflect back on about how that that is. Mm -hmm. it, I just overthought every single thing. I used to get very little sleep and you know just question. But then after you have a few years, you, mm -hmm. you just you learn to trust the process. There's always issues that are going to come up in winemaking, and usually there's a solution. Mm -hmm. Just understanding the premise of the science behind it and your goal for what you're making and being flexible is really important but then realizing that it's it is similar in a way to being a doctor there's issues that are going to come up and instead of really stressing about that it's more like finding what your you know what's your opportunity to change this sure. and so that that gave me confidence as things have come up over the years there's always something that comes up it seems like whether sure. it's with the wines or with the packaging especially packaging, so there's, you know, <laughs> that's, that's an ongoing harvest, mm -hmm. weather, mm -hmm. people, so, yeah. Keeps it interesting. It yeah. keeps it interesting. It keeps it definitely a vintage product. Mm -hmm. It's really, that's one of my favorite things overall about being really closely involved with the production of a wine from an estate like Stoller, where I've had some years and some consistency then, mm -hmm. is that that bottle of wine, that, you, that vintage, has so much depth to it meaning it, mm -hmm. in meaning to me it's a really there's a lot of memories that that bottle of wine can hold and i think that does come with being so involved with sure. a product you're remembering the, the harvest what the weather was like that's incredible i can remember uh, that the fall of any year i can't remember barely anything anymore so <laughs> it's it's fantastic you remember a lot about the season about that harvest in general about the people that worked during harvest mm -hmm. about you know, highlights of the wine, the just everything down the line to bottling. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really special. Amazing. Yeah. So let's talk about your winemaking philosophy and, and sort of, uh, I assume when you came into winemaking, you probably had a philosophy in mind and it's changed over the years. So I'm kind of curious uh, what you would, how you would describe it now and sorry, how, how you describe its evolution. Definitely. I think when I first came into it, I was still learning a lot about wine in general and Pinot Noir. And when I started, this was 2003 and 2004, and the style at that time for Pinot Noir was, was rich and extracted and a lot of oak in general from mm -hmm. my experience. And so that's what I thought I was going for. I was going for this lot of fruit and it needed to be you know, very, um, just very opulent. Mm -hmm. And so my choices then were, were to create that, you know, to look for more oak and to try to really extract the wines. And I think I was missing the finesse of Pinot. I didn't have enough experience making or drinking it then or with Oregon Pinot, because you can't, you can't, unless my parents started having me drink Burgundy when I was 10, which I didn't, <laughs> unfortunately. You know, I just, I didn't have that, but, you know, and that's also what was the style at the time. It was an evolution in general for Pinot Noir in Oregon. It's mm -hmm. such a young industry still, as you know that we we're you know still learning every every year True. so that was my philosophy initially and then as time went on i was able to understand the stoller site which i think has been a, a big blessing in my career mm -hmm. is to have one very consistent medium which is this piece of earth and this dundee hills ava mm -hmm. that stays the same the vines are aging and changing which is very interesting to, to watch but having that consistent piece and then having multiple vintages I started to really learn about what these wine, what these grapes, what kind of wine they produce, and mm -hmm. and it's like getting to know a person. It takes a long time to really get to know somebody, and uh, that changed my winemaking philosophy in general. Because instead of trying to make something stylistically out of this this medium, mm -hmm. I was more interested than in enhancing what was special about this place mm -hmm. and. By doing so, you know some of my techniques changed. I think extraction uh, during fermentation, how much you're gonna look to pull out of your wine, specifically, you know how many punch downs you do, or how what do you do a pump over all these nuanced decisions mm -hmm. you're really doing for an end goal, and that has changed over the years. Vintage changes that. So a warmer year with mm -hmm. higher sugar grapes we will employ different techniques slightly than we would in a cooler year. But in general, more of a balance. I'm looking for the fruit to come through, mm -hmm. really to create some soft tannins from the site. So I work towards that. And then even with barrels and barrel aging and, and stuff, I'm looking for really fresh fruit and acidity and balance. Mm -hmm. Not really anything too extreme on one end or the other. And I've taken that philosophy across the board with 
different vineyards that I work with. I think that that's the beauty of it, right, is to work with really good fruit is the first goal because you can't have anything without that. And then from there, you want to show off what, what's unique about the site. So my winemaking philosophy is to be really just transparent and mm -hmm. moderate with the techniques and tools I use to, to make the wines mm -hmm. and try to use more of a, kind of a balance of oak, not over oak, and things like that. So I think that makes the most interesting wines because you're very much capturing the sense of place where the fruit, what that variety is, where it's growing, what that vintage is, is kind of creating, comes through more without sure. the heavy hands. You mentioned kind of the beauty of the vintage product that it changes year to year and you have this memory of year to year. Is there a particular vintage that you're proudest of for maybe making a good wine where you maybe there wasn't the best fruit to deal with or was there a certain year where you had to kind of overcome a different kind of challenge? Oh, certainly. Yeah, there's been a few of those years and the one that sticks out to me the most because it was the most extreme was 2013 mm -hmm. and 2013 started off as a warm growing season, just starting in the spring, we had an early bud break, we had a warm summer, a lot of heat units, and so it was looking like we were gonna have, again, early harvest, mm -hmm. so early, the beginning of September, and my main concern before harvest started was having to deal with overripe Pinot Noir. You know, Stoller Estate is a very warm spot in the mm -hmm. Dundee Hills. We tend to be one of the first vineyards to start harvesting. And you know that's our exposure and our elevation leads to that, and then the protected nature of the Dundee Hills. Mm -hmm. but, but the fact about the O3 was I was concerned with all this heat, of you know retaining acidity and freshness in the Pinot. So we started harvesting early September with some of our younger sections, and then nice steady going forward. The what was the middle? It's like the the last part of September we had a record-breaking rain event <laughs> in the Willamette Valley that. Since they've been keeping weather records, has we've never had that much rain over a three-day period. I think it was the 26th of September, for the three days after that, where it rained over eight inches in that time, and a lot of fruit was still in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And so, dealing with that was a major issue. I mean, we we have we always as wine makers and growers, and of course, are always looking at the weather mm -hmm. and talking about the weather and tracking five different weather stations and 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 forecasts. And it looked like it looked like it was going to be some rain, and it was the news channels were just going so they were so excited to talk about this <laughs> soon, the monsoon that was coming, and I was I, that happens all they get excited on the news a lot about every every event, a snowflake falls and it's like snow apocalypse. So I didn't really believe it until it didn't the weather didn't change a couple days later. This event was coming towards the end of the week, and I'm looking out at Sunday. I'm like ah, it's it's not gonna rain eight inches, mm -hmm. right? That's ridiculous. And then <laughs> it didn't change, it didn't change. And so we started really harvesting at a rapid pace as much as we could, but so did everybody else in the Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. They all wanted to harvest rapidly as much as they could. So every single person that was capable of harvesting grapes was out working. And so we tried to get a lot of fruit picked, but you'd have, you know, 10, 10 people show up on the crew to harvest for you. Mm -hmm. And so that was really dismaying. And uh, one of my favorite memories about that year was we have a great team here at Stoller and our president, Gary Mortensen, is really dynamic and he's he's got a lot of energy and he's very passionate and so he absorbs all this stress of that there's no pickers out here and there's a lot of fruit to harvest. So he promptly sends out a company-wide email, like everybody get outside, <laughs> drop what you're doing, grab some pruners and go get all your interns, everybody, our accountant, everybody that was here got their shears out, the shears not there, they don't even own them, which I was already <laughs> concerned about. So they go out there and with buckets and like they're like picking like a cluster. And I just, this is not gonna bring in the 25 or 30 tons we're looking for. Someone is gonna lose a finger. And almost right when I said that, sure enough, our accountant, hurt his finger. Luckily, it's still on his hand, but yeah, that kind of did it. I'm like, guys, just go back. This is not efficient. We're not going to appreciate it, but it was so, it was great, and it was funny, and it was stressful, and it was something that you don't forget. So they went back inside and did their proper jobs and kept their ligaments, and we got through it. We got some of the fruit in, but we did have fruit hanging out in the rain, like most people did here in the Willamette Valley, and so it rained just like doomsday and then a few days later it dried out and it was beautiful weather after that just gorgeous Indian summer type stuff and 
I was looking at the fruit that survived this rainstorm and it looked good. It, they didn't have any botrytis exploding. There was no major issues. There was no splitting. So I was just, I'm, I'm an optimist usually. So I was talking to our vineyard manager, like this is great, like let's get it in and let's harvest it. And right when you started picking the grapes and they go into the, the bins, they just let all that facade of looking good <laughs> go and it just flattened and turned oh. into, you know, macerated grapes. So we had to deal with that. It was a lot of our, our, you know, our older vine stuff, best sections. But, you know, took it in, fermented it, did a little bit of different techniques with it to try to encourage some, you know, some concentration and mm -hmm. just try to really be gentle though, not wanting to get a lot of, if there's any kind of, but try to starting not to have that in the wine. But the point being, the wines that we ended up making were really, really nice mm -hmm. and they're beautiful. And if you, it makes sense. I mean, if you have high quality fruit that was just about ready to harvest and it got a lot of it survived through a lot of water. It doesn't mean it's gonna be bad wine. It just mm -hmm. was a struggle. And we were very fortunate here because we have we had a pretty broad spectrum of, of Pinot Noir to blend with that year because like I was saying, we're an early site mm -hmm. and we did harvest a lot of our fruit and made wine out of that fruit before the rain. So it was a big blending exercise in 2013. But the long story short to your question was that is the year that really stuck out because it was major challenges getting mm -hmm. that fruit harvested and really not not easy and the resulting wine was lovely it just took a lot of a lot of a lot of patience and and different techniques and sure. blending really sure. And now that you look back, it's a good experience to have had. Just maybe not at the time, it didn't feel that way. Right, <laughs> and that's what, the, I think that's what winemaking does teach you and in any kind of agriculture probably, right? Working with something that's out of your control really mm -hmm. with the product, with nature. And so you do that and you hopefully can utilize some tools to still, to make it. I, mean, I really feel for people that do the cherries and, and things like that. I mean, that's like major lottery system where mm -hmm. completely out of your control and you can lose your whole harvest. Mm -hmm. So our challenging harvest is knock on wood so far have not been quite as bad as that, <laughs> but they do teach you something every year. Sure. For sure. sure. You talked earlier a little bit about the, the building here and the lead, lead certification and, and, and that. And I still wear is also a B Corp as I understand. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that certification and sort of what that means for the for you and for the company at large? Sure, B Corp is all about sustainability and it's really focusing on not just how you know how well you're doing as a company with profitable margins and, and all this, but it's broader look at really the employees mm -hmm. and the community. So with B Corp we're looking at social um, social issues within our company and what we're doing within the business community. So for instance, we're, we're able to, as a B Corp, really encourage employees to go volunteer mm -hmm. and to be active in the community and um, just make sure that all employees have you know, fair wages and working conditions and things. I'm gonna edit, what do you think, Michelle? What should I add to that? She has the best, most elegant B Corp, <laughs> B Corp uh, analogy. But yeah, it was it was a really great move for us as a company because what it does is it encourages us internally to challenge the company and do better. And mm -hmm. that's we just had a annual uh, all company retreat and we mm -hmm. talked about the B Corp and there's a lot of work to do then because we're we're going down this road. We've committed to this and mm -hmm. what can we do going forward to really stand behind that and empower the people that work here and give back to the community. So I, I feel really good about that because again, it's a commitment mm -hmm. to um, to bettering the team and the, the community. Sure. So what does sustainability then mean to you and your job? For me, sustainability, it's a few things. It's a, it's, it's about the people. I think that's one part about sustainability that sometimes gets overlooked because mm -hmm. a lot of times sustainability can mean like environmentally friendly and recycled materials and that's all tremendously important. But I think sustainability also means taking care of the people because the people are the business. And so for me, that's very important is to be able to work for a company that cares about that. But specifically with myself and my team is to make sure that the team has opportunities, they have a lifestyle balance, they're up to, you know, they, they're up to date with 
their you know their their pay and they also have opportunities for education to mm -hmm. try to keep that open to people and, and things like that mm -hmm. so um, I'm curious uh, you mentioned some of your some of the mentors in the industry I'm curious um, now that you've kind of established yourself in the industry do you feel yourself sort of passing that along? Are you, have you become a mentor the way you were mentored by people like Harry and, and Rich Cushman? I think I have, but maybe in a different way. Mm -hmm. like I've, I'm always open to helping people with opportunities in the wine industry, and that's part of, of, it, of the mentorship that I really enjoy, especially younger people looking to get their foot in the door with the industry and providing people tools to do so and helping them get internships and helping them you know, encourage to go to classes and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then on my team, I hope to be a mentor with winemaking and the philosophies and also the culture, just really appreciating this industry for what it is and being collaborative and being really equal opportunity to people and inviting people for tastings and just mm -hmm. guiding. So I hope so, mm -hmm. yeah. What's it like being a, a woman in the Oregon wine industry? I think it's great. There's a lot of discussion about this, and it's great. People are, you know, celebrating and asking and recognizing women uh, for their contributions in the industry and just in general. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's been it's been great. I mean, I've gotten so much opportunity and support. I work for a great company, which is part of it. I think I was telling you the story about Bill Stoller earlier, mm -hmm. and this came up in an interview about, you know, do you have you felt like you were at a disadvantage as a woman? And I personally have not, mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, I celebrate it. And I, I'm really proud to be in an industry and to be in a position that I am now. And I hope to encourage other women. And that's part of the mentorship too. I do have other women, other young women looking at me and I'm very encouraging to them mm -hmm. to be able to do anything but specifically get into this industry because it's great for women. Women are, have all sorts of positive attributes. They can be really flexible and understand a lot of the nuances of a wine or an opportunity or, and I think they really provide a, a great perspective in, in, in an environment like a winery or a vintage or this industry in general, there's, you have to be so, so open-minded. And I think a lot of times women can do that fantastically. Not that men can't. And that's something that I was always, I'm always really guarded about. Like it's sure. not a sexist thing. I just think, I do think there's feminine traits in general and masculine traits in general. And ideally you have both working together to really create something special. And that's something I very much appreciate about being here at Stoller, the Stoller Wine Group has almost equal amounts of men and women working in throughout the company, especially in leadership roles, and it, it's fantastic. And that's something I look for on our team for Harvest. I really like to try to hire ideally equal amounts of men and women because I've found that it creates a more balanced working environment. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed in your time in the industry, um, uh, has that, you mentioned it's been a positive experience for you being a woman in the industry. Have you noticed an increase in, in female presence in the Oregon wine industry? I have, yeah, I definitely have. But I, I see that specifically with, um, in the winemaking spectrum with interns. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of equal, almost equal applicants, men and women now, which a handful of years ago, I struggled to find to find women interns. Sure. And so that's really encouraging. I think there's a lot more understanding of wine, a lot more appreciation for younger for the younger generation, and a lot of women are coming even just to the tasting room. That's been a big change, seeing who comes to the winery to drink the wine. And there's droves of young women coming and enjoying wines and taking wine tasting classes and really getting educated compared to even a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's been a change. So I, I would assume that that would lead to more women in the industry in general. Sure. Yeah. You interact with consumers, I assume, fairly regularly as part of your job. I'm curious what you've noticed, uh, how consumers have changed in the last, say, 10, 15 years in the industry. What's different about them now than when you started? Well, the first and foremost are a lot younger. <laughs> so I'm also a lot older. So <laughs> I don't know which one, I can, which one leads to that, he but he probably they're a lot younger. <laughs> I'm not that old. Uh, but they, yeah, just the, the clientele, the people that are coming out tasting to wineries. When I was just starting here with this new facility in 2005, our tasting room was appointment only. Mm -hmm. And we'd have people come in, but rarely were there people that were coming in under 40. It just mostly mm -hmm. 
not happening. And now it's just, again, it's, it's more common. Like wine is on the table uh, for younger people. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's been the biggest change, I think. And people being more open-minded to different varietals, that's changed as well. For a long time, uh, th there was an ABC kind of phenomenon, anything but Chardonnay, <laughs> and people just didn't want, they just would pronounce this almost. The first thing that you would meet them in, in the tasting, I, I just don't want, I don't like Chardonnay. And that seems to be changing. People are more understanding that Chardonnay is, is something, it can go so many different directions, mm -hmm. right? And there's be obviously beautiful Chardonnays. And rosé is the same thing. It's when I started making rosé in 2005, there wasn't very much a, a domestic rosé on the market. Mm -hmm. And now, obviously, you know, there's rosé everywhere. And there's all these rosé all day. You know, it's just a <laughs> tremendous explosion as a category. But that's, that's changed. I think that's gotten the messaging for wine in general, but even rosés and appreciating them have gotten o across a lot of different ages mm -hmm. and consumer type. You're also, I, I'm curious, uh, besides being younger, are consumers also asking you different questions or having different expectations from your wine now? I would say yes. They have different expectations. They want, people want accessibility mm -hmm. and they want to know a story behind their wines and they want to get behind that, I think. So that's, that's great. And I think that it, there's not as much of this, um, I don't say fear is the right word, but people can get intimidated mm -hmm. with wines. And especially, because you never learn enough. You, you never know everything, I guess is what I'm trying to say about mm -hmm. wines. And that's what's, I think, great about it. But that intimidation factor is sort of waning and people are asking more questions and admitting, I don't know what that is or what, what this is or what varietal this is and feeling more confident with it. So those two things, for sure, I think people are really engaged. And again, a big takeaway for me is people want accessibility to your wine and they want to know where it comes from, they want it, but they also want to know that they can get it and they don't have to pay a mountain of money to get this nice quality product. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely different. Sure. You had talked a little bit earlier about the Stiller Wine Group, which is kind of a new, a new change for you. Tell me a little bit about the changes you've been undergoing the last couple of years. Sure, yeah, this is something that's really exciting to me is, is the Stoller Wine Group. So Stoller Family Estate is owned by Bill Stoller. He's a third generation Oregonian. He started this back in 95 with the vineyard and mm -hmm. I was telling you a little bit earlier mm -hmm. about the history of a Stoller brand. He also has been partners of Shehalem Winery mm -hmm. for 25 years plus. And recently, as of this last spring of 2017, Bill purchased all of the shares to Shehalem Winery. So, you must not be, you gotta okay. say that because it was February 2018. So. Oh, 18, not 17? It was 18. Okay. So, <laughs> let's start That's over. That's a big deal. That's so. a big deal. It felt like it was 17. I still think it's 18. So, apologies, but it feels like it's 18. It does still feel like it's Not 19. Okay, so. <laughs> so, yeah, the Stoller Wine Group is recently formed. I'm really excited about it. Mm -hmm. And it comes from a history starting with Bill Stoller, having his estate vineyard planted in 95. Stoller brand started in 01. Winery is built in 05 here at the Stoller Estate. Bill Stoller has been partners with Shehalem Winery for over 25 years. And this last spring of 18, he purchased all of the shares of Shehalem Winery. And doing so, you know, he's got the Stoller Estate, we've got Shehalem under the umbrella. Also, we've launched a couple new brands mm -hmm. under this umbrella, which is the Stoller Wine Group. We started a canned wine program called Canned Oregon that came in the 18th spring as well. It's a busy spring for us. <laughs> so Canned Oregon launched, and that's something that we're talking about growth and changes of consumer mm -hmm. is a really good example of that as people want access to wines and they're appreciating wine in a portable package. Mm -hmm. So Canned Oregon is under the Stoller Wine Group. We also started a brand called Chemistry. And Chemistry is a brand, it's a Willamette Valley brand, and it's, we source different AVAs, but we're blending and making these wines to be accessible, to be really friendly price points, and to you know, offer uh, consumers a really good look at quality Willamette Valley wines, and it's a good introduction to them. So Chemistry, Canned Oregon, Shehalem, and in addition, we have a brand called History. Mm -hmm. And History is a brand that I started in 2013, 
and it's a collection of some of the oldest vineyards in the Pacific Northwest. I started this and ended up about a year later partnering with Bill and mm -hmm. Stoller Family Estate, so it's a joint venture. So we make all of the history wines at Stoller Family Estate. We source all of the fruit. Primarily it's from Washington, so old vine Cabernet Sauvignon, mm -hmm. we've got some Muscat, Pinot Noir and Gewurztraminer from the Columbia Gorge. So history is the other brand under this umbrella. So because of all of this, it made sense then to form a wine group. Mm -hmm. So I'm really proud to be a part of it and I'm really happy for Bill in particular because I think it's great that it's the first Oregonian to start this wine group here. Mm -hmm. And it makes a lot of sense for us because there's shared, there's shared services with our team. There's a really nice array of SKUs and, and price points. Mm -hmm. and so it offers us a lot of flexibility but it's also inspiring because there's great vineyards to work with and it supports our growth here. What's the reaction to your, to canned wine? Well, most people are really excited about it. I think the first thing to remind, to let people know is a can is a half a bottle of wine. So a bit of, of change from, you know, you're, you're usually drinking something out of a can quickly and it's <laughs> new. But aside from that, that nuance, I think the consumers are really excited about it. Tremendously, mm -hmm. actually. It's surprising to me because of the reaction, not just from consumers, but our distributor partners across the U.S. are, are very optimistic and excited about having a high quality wine in a can because there's a lot of clients that are, are very uh, much supportive of it. People mm -hmm. that own country, you know, country club owners mm -hmm. and golf courses and pools and, mm -hmm. and all sorts of lifestyle type things. So it's been, it's been an interesting category and it's so new, it feels a little bit Wild West in a sense, because it's pioneering. And, it, and I think that's also exciting about it. But again, the reaction from the consumers and distributors has, has been really optimistic. So we'll see. We're not even a year in yet, so we don't have data, we don't have sales data, all this to really support anything. We're just going out of confidence with it. And a lot to add to the confidence is the, the um, availability of very high quality fruit here in the Willamette Valley and being able to craft a wine that's delicious and in a can so mm -hmm. yeah we shall see it'll be interesting to see I think the market is, is exploding in general and I'm curious you know the next few months as these spring wines come out rosés and pinot gris and such how many more cans mm -hmm. and can brands get introduced mm -hmm. and I don't know I don't know if it's a fad I don't know if it's here to stay but we're we definitely invested heavily into it sure. and we're going forward with candor <laughs> so yeah so you clearly are you clearly pretty tied to the sales and marketing part of, of what you're working with here. I'm curious, uh, we obviously do a lot of these interviews, we hear a lot of people talk about how much they love making wine and drinking wine and how much they hate selling wine. So uh, I'm curious uh, the challenges for you uh, and for Stoller Group in general, selling wine uh, with a crowded marketplace and, and sort of what your strategies are for dealing with that. Well, I think our strategies is, is we, we hire, we have a phenomenal sales team. That's number one. And they really are the ones that are carrying the weight of all of our brands. And it's a huge job. And they are really good at what they do. We've got two sales folks, uh, Bill Hansen and Corey Davis, that have both been with us for quite a while. And then we recently hired three additional sales team across the U.S. So we've got this all-star team, and that's what they have to do all of that. <laughs> no, but they, no, they get a lot of the credit for that, for sure. And then, in addition, we have a very strong direct-to-consumer presence. So hospitality and direct-to-consumer is huge for the Stoller Wine Group in general. Mm -hmm. And that's a tremendous amount of work as well. We have an all-star team there. So we're, we've been actively putting energy into this, and it is hard. And there's, it's what comes down to it. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication, but it's extremely important to us. And um, for instance, at the you know, tasting room here at Stoller, we have high traffic, and at times now it's become so busy on the weekends that it looks like a state park. So I've called it the Stoller State Park. <laughs> it's a blessing, but it's also again a tremendous amount of work to take care of all these people and keep them happy mm -hmm. and really be good representatives of the of the brand and our tasting room associates you know have to tell people 40 times a day about the same wine and be smiling and I'm, I'm not very good at that I try but it's yeah it's, it's important and for me personally I've you know, been here for a long time as a winemaker and it's a big part of my the expectation of what I do is to represent the brand and I'm proud to do it but I know it's a lot of work and so mm -hmm. I don't go into it 
it's a lot of fun too a lot of times you know, you're doing these events and you're in interesting places with great people but you have to be on and sometimes it's more exhausting than a harvest day because you go home after something big and you're smiling and you're, you, maybe you're a little you have to be very friendly and you go home I just don't want to talk to anybody <laughs> at all just full of popcorn a beer a movie you know don't look, even look at me so yeah it's a lot of work in, in the long, long of it but we're as a company, we put a lot of time and a lot of energy into sales and direct-to-consumer sales. It's not easy. What do, you, what do you think it is about, what, what sells a Stoller wine? Like, what is it about Stoller wine that makes people excited? Well, it's absolutely delicious. Best wine out there. But besides that, it, I, think the, I think the accessibility is, is something that does sell the wine. It's, it's a sense of place. It's one estate vineyard for, specifically for the Stoller wines in general and there's a connection to the quality so we, I think I feel like the wines that we make are sold at a value mm -hmm. so for instance our largest blend of Pinot Noir the Dundee Hills Pinot Noir from Stoller Family Estate it's a collection of the entire vineyard so you get every clone in essence of Pinot all the different elevations it's a I call it our mosaic Pinot Noir because it is it's like a, if you took a little snapshot of that that vineyard, over 200 acres of vineyard, you get most everything in the bottle. And that goes you know, into barrel and it goes through barrel aging and a lot of blending and, and just high end mm -hmm. care or meticulous care more like. And we sell that for $30, $30, $35. And that's, again, a value. So I think now that enough vintages have gone by, there's a trust in the wines that we produce. And there's also an appreciation of the of the value that it's offered, and that's it's not been overnight, I and mean, we've it's been going on since 2001. Really, the brand has been around, so I think it's culminating now. And a lot of that goes back to Bill Stoller's vision of what he was creating here mm -hmm. is you know, the world class vineyard, he says, and it is, and and winery as well, and all the tools you'd want. Really investing in people mm -hmm. in all seriousness. Great. I I'm no, don't say lately we have a great team. Uh, that's a big piece of it, but then he did had the vision of creating that value. Mm -hmm. I remember when we first built this winery in 2005, and we got the tasting room by appointment open, and we were setting, we were talking about pricing. I would, I was very concerned with us coming out with having a $30 Pinot Noir because all of our neighbors and all of the valley, for the most part, Pinot Noirs were more than that, and it just felt like we were coming out and selling ourselves short. And I didn't want that perception, so I know everything that goes into it, but Bill was adamant that this is what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And I think now it's really built from that. Mm -hmm. Not to say that we can give away wine, it's really, you know, we don't, but that's a big part of it, I think, the combination of all those things, of the accessibility, the quality, the consistency, mm -hmm. and, and then I think the story as well. I think because we have been part of this industry for a long time and our sales team has been out, and the people know the wines more broadly and locally as well, mm -hmm. the people know Stoller, mm -hmm. that's led to the, you know, to the success. Sure. You mentioned that you're a native of Oregon, native of the area. Uh, I'm curious if you can remember your first impressions of the Oregon wine industry when you got started and, and, and sort of what's, what's, what, you, what you thought you were getting into and what you actually got into. That's a good question. Yeah, I got started, like I mentioned, my first, well, I think 2000 was probably when I got started, maybe a little bit before that, because I took some courses and dabbled and started doing tastings. Mm -hmm. And then I worked in the, in the gorge at a winery called Cascade Cliffs before Cooper Mountain in the tasting room. But that was one look at it, but coming into working in a winery, it was, it was much smaller is the obvious thing. And there was only a few hundred wineries, I think 250 when I started, right around there in 01, maybe a little bit more. But it was smaller, it was easier to know the different wineries, not necessarily with a lot of depth, but know who the producers were. And it was very network-based, it still is, but winemakers, have been, and, and viticulturists have groups and tastings, and that was, I think, normal, right? It just, it, I'd been able to go through so many different tastings and, and have people come through the cellar and provide feedback. You know, Lynn Pennerash and Steve Dorner and Cruz would come through and you exchange, and, and it still is like that today, but again, then it was a quarter of the size. And the sophistication wasn't there. You know, it was, it was high quality and passionate, but, mm -hmm. We didn't have 
podcasts and, and all this stuff, all, you know, the same kind of marketing that Oregon and just presence that we have now. Mm -hmm. So that's changed a lot. So getting just smaller, but it's been really interesting to watch this grow. And I feel like Oregon, the industry in the Willamette Valley here is growing in the, in the right way. It feels very organic. And I think there's, it, there's a lot of things changing, a lot of questions now by people coming in out, outside investments. Mm -hmm. And the world really now is looking at Oregon. Mm -hmm. And rec it's been recognized as the place that it is for growing top quality wines. And that's going to change things. But I feel like that's also natural with the way that the world is changing. There's a lot of people and everything's getting, everything's getting more populated and more crowded. So it doesn't feel like it's separate from that. It's just part of mm -hmm. the, the process that we're all going through right now on this small planet, right? But <laughs> yeah, certainly back in 2001, it was just, it was like family. You know, was, you got to, got to know all sorts of people. And I, I feel grateful for that because I'm not sure I'd have the same opportunity if I was new to the industry now to have that kind of relationship with the people that I've gotten to know through tastings and events and networking and the owners of wineries and winemakers. And, mm -hmm. and that, I think that makes Oregon really special because it's a cast of characters, right? It's like a big family. <laughs> and so this has led to, to our success collectively. Sure. Yeah. You mentioned the, the kind of changes in the up in the air sort of status right now that it feels like. What, what do you see for Oregon as you look in, say, 10, 15 years into the future? What, what's changing? What's, what's happening next? I think that there naturally will be a lot of growth, continued growth in the industry because of the soils, the land, the, everything that we've built, our reputation on, all the people that worked hard to make these wines for so long and, and demonstrate the quality. So growth will be happening, tremendous growth. And with that, there'll be more people, more tourism coming in. And I think Oregon has a lot to offer. I think there'll be, I think it'll support the Oregon economy. I think that it, it will become more and more of a destination for people to come and for wine, for food, for agriculture, for recreation. And that'll, yeah, have more jobs come in. So it'll look, it'll look different in 10 years. It'll, I bet it'll double from now. So we'll see, land will get more expensive. Mm -hmm. the whole thing but again i think we've our foundation of an industry is is super is very solid mm -hmm. and i hope that it continues that way but there's there's a big sustainability thread through it all there's a lot of people with families and the owners are passionate about the land and what they're doing mm -hmm. and i feel like that will continue so i think that's going to be i think it'll be positive but it'll be much more crowded <laughs> <laughs> What does it mean to you to see a wine labeled Oregon or a wine labeled Willamette Valley? Well, it's home and it, I think it's, it makes me proud, right? I think the more that we have out there and, and the more you travel and you see at Oregon wine, it, I think that it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really, I'm thrilled to see Oregon wines when I go out. You know, if you go, if you go out of the United States, you know, if you're in Australia and you see an Oregon wine, it's like, wow, it's a, it, it supports the fact that Oregon is on the global stage, a, a phenomenal place to grow and make wine. So yeah, I'm excited about it. And I think it's the more recognition Oregon gets, the more people can pronounce Willamette, the better. So <laughs> might, oh, we have, you know, that front and center on labels. It's great. Even just Oregon and just the, the, uh, the, rec the understanding of where the wine's from. And, it's exciting, sure. is the answer, I think. So we talked about kind of Oregon wine in general in the future. What about more specifically Stolwar? You've obviously had a lot of changes just recently. Yes. Uh, what do you see as you look at Stolwar 10 or 15 years down the road? Well, I know it will not be the same place that it is now. It never has been. And I see the same as I see with the industry in general. I think Stolwar will go through tremendous growth mm -hmm. because we want it and we're ready for it and we're, um, you know, we're, we're investing in, in growth and in, in change. So we'll see, I mean, the canned Oregon brand that has a lot of opportunity for growing. You know, I think that the consumer being younger and younger coming in and the, the wine per capita going up and up in the United States, I think there's a lot of opportunity for the Stoller Wine Group. There's a lot of great vineyards, there's potential for vineyard lands. So we'll see, but I hope that in, you know, 10 years, we're much bigger than we are now, but we have the same roots of, 
of Oregon and quality and phenomenal team. And we will, we will I think. And I think it, a lot of it goes back to the start, you know, with Bill Stoller has created his wealth through starting a staffing company. Mm -hmm. So he's all about network and people. And in all honesty, he built this company that way and we're going that direction. So as long as nothing radical changes, which it hopefully does not, I feel excited about the future and I hope to sit down in 10 more years and be like, look at this and be like, wow, back then, you know, here's what we were doing and now look at this and be excited about it. So, sure. yeah. Do you have any particular goals, personal goals for something you'd like to see the company do or you'd like to see yourself do uh, in the next decade? Yeah, I think I would like to see us really um, support the B Corp and the vision for sustainability in a whole myriad of ways. I would like to see what we can do now that we have such a collectively powerful team of people and we have more of a presence now in the market since we're making more wines, what we can do to make a very positive impact mm -hmm. in the community and with our employees and sustainably. So, because I think it's a great opportunity to do so. Mm -hmm. So yeah, one of my goals is to be a company that everybody wants to work for and be a company that people are happy working here and they're well taken care of and they're also thinking about other things besides themselves. So you have enough, you know, you have enough time, you have enough there and enough impetus for that to, to do that, to literally go out once a month and it's something, it's my goal for this year, once a month go out and do something for the community and just be that person. So I think again, we have the opportunity to do that with our growth and I hope that again, and the next time we talk in 10 years or whenever it is, that we're like, yeah, here's what we're doing and we've been at it for a while. Sure. You mentioned earlier you're, you're kind of the way you got into the industry and, and you and you kind of you talked about if you you weren't sure if it would be the same coming into it now, uh, the same availability of people. Uh, what advice would you give someone who wanted to get into the industry today? Well, I, I would give anybody that asked me that I do just just get out there and do things and go to tastings and get yourself familiar, drink wines and, and explore, you know and. If depending on what part of the industry you want to get into, let's say you want to get into winemaking, then naturally look at trying to get an internship somewhere. Mm -hmm. Take some classes. What do you have educationally? Like you know, take supplementing classes. Then if you need to take a chemistry class, or if you want to take you know something online from Davis, they offer most places offer remote classes now. So get educated, get involved, network, and go to events. I mean, just start talking. Just introduce it. Literally, just. In, interject yourself into events and, and networking opportunities, and that's how it starts. Mm -hmm. just, it takes effort. Yeah. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have planned for you. Uh, is there anything I should have asked you about? Anything else you'd like to say before we? I don't know. What do you think, Michelle? Closing thoughts. You did great. I kind of mumble it. So it's <laughs> <laughs> a lot of talking. You did great. Okay. Thank you. Usually, I like to listen more than I like to talk. Yeah. But okay, I think it was good. Just hopefully you make me look like, cut out all the, the stuff that's terrible, and then, yeah. No, oh, you look I great. appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for your time and for your yeah. candid, thoughtful answers. Yeah, no, good. No. I hope it was something. It's, it is, all you can do is offer your own perspective, but it has been interesting to be at the same place for this long mm -hmm. and see all these changes, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. I never thought that I would necessarily be somewhere for this long with the same company, but this year was 15 years this summer. So it's pretty, 16 harvests. I know, that's incredible. <laughs> and it's still exciting because it's changed so much. So good. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thanks. And, yeah. th and thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys.